My name is John Perello. Um, I'm a principal engineer in the Chief Technology and Architecture Office for Cisco. Uh, what that means is the CTO office in, in, most, uh, in most companies. C uh, C Chief Technology and Architecture for, uh, for Cisco is both the development and, uh, and network architectures. Um, I am responsible for running our innovation program as well. Across Cisco, we have about 14 innovation centers uh, in 14 different cities. I run the engineering across all of them. Been with Cisco a while, um, came to Cisco in 99, came here doing from a network management startup. I've worked on just about every network management product that we've had from back in the early days of Cisco Works and Prime. I was on the original team that, uh, that did the WLSE, the wireless LAN controller, um, the beginnings of DNA. Uh, I did some internals and things like that as well on uh, compilers that go into the Doppler ASIC. If everybody knows what the Doppler ASIC is, that is our ASIC that runs um, our Catalyst line of switches. So that was fun. I got to run a compiler in there. And then um, as I was working on the in in innovation teams, blockchain started to come into, into, onto our radar. So I'll give you a, a little overview of what we used to do for blockchain. I'm going to start with a story first. Um, I used to teach computer science uh, back in New York. Um, and I was teaching C++. Anybody who's watching this on the video has probably heard this story from another session, but I like to tell this story. I'm teaching C++, and we have Bjorn Strauss-Stroop, the inventor of C++ from AT&T, comes in to give a talk. And there's this crazy thing in the beginning of C++, it's not there any longer, um, where if you wanted to make a class abstract, you had to set a function pointer equal to zero. You didn't get a keyword on the compiler, like abstract or anything like that. You set the function declaration into zero, equal to zero, and there were books on this, like, well, it's a pure virtual function and all this like stuff. And I was like, this is the most confusing thing I could ever teach. It was hard to explain why did we do it. So now I'm like, you know, 28 years old. I'm like, hey, I get to ask a question. Why did you not just put a keyword onto the compiler called abstract and run it through? And he said, well, I was working at AT&T. I was in the technology office. The guy who owned the compiler was in another business unit, right? He was on vacation. He didn't quite like our group because his project was getting canceled, so he wouldn't give me the keyword. So I said, the heck with that. I'll just set the function equal to zero, <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll go on. And then there were books written about this, about how it was like this unbelievably complex thing for it. And it was really just two guys couldn't get along within the company. OK. The reason I bring that up is, have you ever read our CLI? Like, sometimes, why do we have that? So a lot of, a lot of what I'm going to do is, is try to give you why we're doing some things in here. Why are we doing things with block, like, why are we doing blockchain, and what are we trying to do? Um, the thing about a lot of sessions is that you're, I'm coming in, and I'm, I'm giving you instruction, uh, uh, maybe trying to teach you about things that are concrete. We've been deploying them for a long time. But with blockchain, this is something new that we're developing, right? So a lot of times, I want to get some feedback. I'm going to tell you where we're at what you have to get ready for when you're deploying blockchain systems and IoT systems that are getting there. But a lot of, some of these things are still in flux. We may go one way, we may go another way. And it's not just Cisco. I mean, the whole industry is going that way on that. So with that, I just kind of want to ask, I mean, what, what are some things that you were doing? You're looking at me first. So what's something that you were trying to come out with from, from this session that you wanted to find out, or you were dying to find out about in blockchain? Trying to see what the uh, enterprise principles were. A lot of mm -hmm. people So about APIs deploying, why use this versus a database? So, OK, anybody else? I'm just going to pick you out there. Sorry to put you on the spot. No? Um, I'm just uh, looking at uh, when the uh, modern marketplace uh, is going to look different for our customer and looking at some of these things okay. from a former computer to back and try to kind of see understanding the okay. Okay, so the similar databases, how to deploy that across your network, what's going to be the impact on your network, and what do I have to get ready for? Okay, great. So it seems like you want to know about what kind of things we're using in blockchain, how to deploy it on your network, right? Okay, good. We got that ready. Anybody else have anything other different than those kind of concerns or anything in there? Not to put you on the spot, but there we go. Yes? I'm building a blockchain over a web 
looking for uh, use cases that people are interested in. Use cases, okay, good, so use cases. So, so far I got you covered, use cases. What we're gonna, uh, we are gonna be talking about like the differences between databases and blockchain and why you use it. Some of the use cases that we are currently doing and then I'll talk about, about deployment models and what we're doing. So when the deployment models, when it comes down to it, you'll take a look. I'll show you the architectures that we've got of the, of the, of the different sy blockchain systems that we are deploying. And you can kind of take a look and say, okay, that's coming on my network. That's, you know, what's the best practices on that, right? First of all, this is an IoT session. I'm talking about blockchain and IoT. That's the specific example I'm gonna go in there. I'm not gonna get into the, ben the, the benefits and the reasons that you're gonna need IPv6 for this stuff. I mean, if you're putting in a system that has a lot of sensors and we're gonna be doing, we're gonna be validating those, we're kind of assuming this is an IoT environment with IPv6 and things like that on that. Okay, so that's, there's courses on that and, and things, yes? Really quick question. Sure. Um, are you gonna be talking about this, um, Cisco's um, building blockchain system? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. What I'm gonna talk about is, uh, is the Cisco blockchain that we've built. Okay, so um, I'm from the innovation group. We decide, we go through this thing where it's build, buy, or um, invest, co-develop, and all that. There's a whole thing on that. It's just everybody does that, right? So um, we decided on this one to build, all right? There wasn't, some, there wasn't a company that we were gonna go and buy, uh, especially right now, you know, and that doesn't preclude us from doing that because we're a buying machine when it comes down to buying companies. Um, investing in companies, there were a lot of small companies out there, they seemed to be focused on, the, on sort of the cryptocurrencies and things, so we didn't really invest in that. And we actually went out and built the platform, so we're building on our own platform, but I'll get into those in detail. So good, thank you. It gives me an idea of what you're trying to go through. The, la the last thing I want you all to do is to like think, oh wow, I wish this session was this, and then, and then it didn't go through on the other one. Also, if you keep me on my toes, the best question gets a red bottle. <laughs> okay, so let's get into it. So I'm gonna go over the introduction to blockchain. There's a DLT next to that. Distributed ledger technology. Our marketing team seems to be going back and forth between the two. Distributed ledger technology versus blockchain. Only because a lot of blockchain out there is becoming uh, associated with um, cryptocurrencies and things like that, and it's, we're really more on the distributed ledger, and I'll go more into that. So if you see that acronym DLT around distributed ledger technology, it's not like a dynamic LTE or anything like that. It's distributed ledger technology on that, okay? Um, I'm gonna go over the reference models and architectures, which th that will give you a hint into what we're doing in there and best practices, the architectures that, of the systems that we are looking at and how we're trying to deploy them in IoT, okay? Um, I'm gonna be talking about two, um, two things that we've done. Uh, the MUD protocol, the Manufacturer Usage Description Protocol, um, that's something in the IoT space that we have been working on and we think that's gonna be prevalent on, along with blockchain, as well as um, an IoT transport um, application that we've, we've developed in there. Uh, you can go down on the world of solutions and see the IoT transport application down there as well, as well as another blockchain um, example that we have built, um, which is using uh, blockchain for compliance. Um, for network compliance, which is probably of, of value to you if you're talking about like, okay, um, looking at configurations, making sure that they are uh, auditable, okay? So you can see that down on the floor of the uh, world of solutions. The other thing is there's a trusted IoT alliance. The trusted IoT alliance is a consortium that we have put together um, to work on IoT, securing IoT, and then blockchain. And the majority of the work that they're doing in the trusted IoT alliance is on blockchain. The architectures are gonna be coming out of that uh, as well as a group that we worked on, which is uh, OpenFog. Uh, the OpenFog platform was something that we had done in the early days of IoT. Uh, there's, there's about 50 plus members on that as well, and you know, we'll talk about how we're getting a consortium together. At Cisco, for a lot of these things, you can't do it alone. Um, I, I was lucky enough to work on the um, IP telephony in the early days. I mean, you, you, can, you can tell. If you don't start to work with your competitors and partners and things in an open way, you're never gonna make a phone call over the internet. If you're gonna try to go from the POT system to voice over IP, you've gotta do it with a standards-based approach. This is according to the Cisco playbook. We will, we will come up with a technology, make a consortium, and then, and then try to bring it out to the standards. Okay, with that, let's get into it. Okay. WebEx teams, there's a group in there. Uh, some of the blockchain people are, are monitoring it as well um, and during the session. Just feel free to ask a question over here. If you ask another question from here on in, you will get something. 
but that's just uh, more fun. But ask questions in there. And if you have questions that when you get later, um, this is going to be stay open for a while. I think you've seen that all from the other sessions. So um, introduction, what is, a block, uh, what is a blockchain? So a blockchain is a digital ledger that um, stores transactions between, the, um, between different participants. And it keeps a history of all of the, uh, the transactions. So if everybody's familiar with databases, and the question you were saying, like, what is the difference between a database and a blockchain? Assuming everybody's familiar with the database, if you're not, just think of it as a spreadsheet with columns on there. Each row, when you t get a row of data, can be signed with an extra column on the end to know that, okay, I've got a signature across the, across the row so that now each column can be assured that no one has tampered with it because I can do the checksum on the end and check the signature on that, right? So I can tell the row wasn't tampered with. What happens with blockchain is we also sign that row with the row before it that it came in the, in the block, in, in, the, in the entire data set. Which means that if you try to insert a row in the table or, ins or change something, it is, is not only going to be across the, uh, across the row, it's going to be across the columns going down. So that each block then is signed when, it, when it's going in there. So the information goes into a block, the row is signed, the block is signed, and then it's put back on the, on the ledger. Now, if anybody tampers with that, you can immediately verify that somebody, that somebody has, has messed with that. So imagine you've got a spreadsheet of information in there, you can tell, okay, I passed that around. I know nobody's tampered with the columns. I know nobody's tampered with the rows. Now, that's what you would do with one instance on this. The, the, the difference with blockchain is that it's distributed in nature, in that every single participant of this, of the blockchain, has a complete copy of the data. So figure, I'm using the spreadsheet analogy in there. I've got a spreadsheet. You've got a spreadsheet. You've got a spreadsheet. We all have the same spreadsheet. You want to add something to it. You want to add a row to it. You have to sign it put it on the row, but what they'll do is everyone will get a copy of the change, everyone will then say, yes, I agree with that, and then put the record back in and we sign it on that, okay? So there's a consensus protocol that is going on here. Everybody has to agree before something's being put on there. So everybody maintains their own copy, and then everyone signs it, and we make sure that everybody agrees that this information should be put in there. That's what the protocol is going on in here. Now, what happens is, there are different types of blockchain. So when you hear about blockchain, the most famous thing that everybody starts to hear about is, is in Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is an example of a use of that blockchain, of that information. Now, way on one end, you have the database. Column, name, value, pairs, it's data, data stored. Um, it's just uh, data stored uh, by key value pairs or by row and columnar data. This, the computer science behind a database is based on tuple calculus and set theory. And set theory in blockchain is based on crypto and also set theory. So you have set theory and crypto that's going on top of that to, to sign the rows and put it in there. Now, there are different types of blockchain. There's a permissionless, public, shared one. Now, that means anyone can join in this blockchain. Anyone on the internet, you want to join in the blockchain? Fine. Get a copy, start using it. But I don't know you when you join in on this blockchain. So but we all have copies of this information. You want to join in? I say, great, join on in. You're going to sign the information. I don't know who you are. So what you have to do is you have to give me some sort of proof that you've done something. And in the Bitcoin, it's usually proof of work. You have to compute a long, a long number, and you come back with the next prime. And I say, oh, well, OK, you did some work. You proved that you did something. And, and so now I, you, I, I will say, OK, I can verify that you actually did that. OK, I'll let, you, I'll let you change the ledger. Because it's public. Anybody can come in here and do this. I've got to have some proof of who you are, because I can't validate your identity. So just prove that you did something. And there's different ways of doing that proof. There's proof of work. There's sometimes there's proof of an action. Y uh, in a, a simplistic way, I could say, you know what, I'll let you in. And you're in charge of just, say, some building or something. And I'm going to say, OK, I'm going to let you in. And flick the lights on for me, right? <laughs> OK, I saw you did something. So I can prove of an action. I didn't, I didn't make him compute something. But I did make you do, perform an action to know that you're in control of it. If you're a website or something, hey, post this on your website. You have permission for that, right? If I'm going to look at, uh, for, for most of what the public uh, things do is, is a proof of work. And that's why you see people getting all these GPUs and things. So they're trying to compute large, larger numbers in there. A permissioned public one is saying, well, you need permission to enter in, into it. 
but it's still public in that anybody can come in there. You have to go to one authority and say, okay, one authority is gonna come in here, I'm gonna be the authority, I'm gonna let you come in, and then you get to participate. So you're gonna say, okay, it's permissioned, you're allowed to come in, yes? Uh, yeah, so in the permissioned one, you have to come in and you have to log in, and now I let you, I let you, uh, I let you in, right? So that's one in there, right? But it's public, anybody can get in there. So you can go in there and get permission, so it's like signing up for a, you're gonna sign up for a, a, an email address, right? It's permission, but it's public, anybody can go in there. But you just gotta sign in first, get a credential, okay, now I let you in. And, and there's some sort of validation that's gonna be done in there, and the worst case on something like that, um, uh, where it's just completely, where it's completely open, there's not much proof of work or anything in there. It's just gonna let you in and put you in there. If a state started putting a, in there, well, let me last, do the last one, then you ask that question again. Okay, permission private shared, right? Permissioned, it's a private network now, okay? So, it's gonna be Cisco, um, my, um, my suppliers, uh, my bank, okay? Only, we're the only ones who are gonna get in on this thing, right? I already know who the people are gonna be on this thing uh, ahead of time, and we're gonna get certificates amongst ourselves, and we're gonna, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna join in on this uh, original. Uh, we're gonna join in on the system because I'm gonna have uh, um, certificates that are put on there. Now, for the Cisco blockchain that we developed in here, we came out with a distributed way of doing a certificate authority. Okay, so we don't have to go to one certificate, because even in a permissionless, in a permission system, somebody has to issue the certificate and say, okay, you're the one, you are who you say you are, right? But we came up with a distributed way of doing that, so we don't have to have one signer for it. We also use the blockchain in itself and the community to say, okay, we all agree that you are Bob, so we're gonna let Bob in. We knew Bob is coming, right? Bob is gonna log in, and then we're gonna say, okay, let's all agree, and then we all, we all sign the certificate, and now the certificate is given to Bob, because we expected Bob to be here. So, the question was, on a voting system, where would you go? It would be the center one, yeah. It would be the center one. You're not gonna ask everybody, anybody come in and, proof of work, and do some proof of work that, you, can, that you, you are who you are and then and go in there. It would have to be that one in there, yeah. Okay, these are the different types that we have in there. We are looking, as you can tell, if you think about it from the way I was talking about it, a permissioned, private, shared system. That's what we are looking for. That's the one that we developed, where everybody knows each other, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, the distributed. Yes. Okay, so uh, the question is how do we go about doing the system? That is, the, how do we go about signing and, and doing the distributed authentication keys? Okay, so the system that we are deploying is our blockchain, our blockchain system. So we deploy a node on each one of the different machines and, and, and everybody's in there. That is the same system that we are using for the distributed keys, okay? So it's not like we have a separate uh, key server on this thing, it's part of our blockchain. So it's kind of, it's kind of, we're, it's kind of uh, almost turtles all the way down. We're using the blockchain system as well in order to sign our certificates and say that you are who you are, okay? How do you bootstrap Yeah, so how do you bootstrap it? We bootstrap it with an, with an initial key, right? Yeah, configure it for the small number of participants. Exactly. Small, number of participants. Exactly. Exactly. We have to seed it originally with uh, with a small number. So you need at least th uh, two or three. It's you've done it with two, but it's usually like three on that, right? So we'll seed it in the beginning, and then after that we go on. Yes. So everybody see that? What we're doing is we're beginning with a small trusted group that we seed, and then everybody else is going to sign and let everybody else in. So, okay. Okay, so the question is, how do we, uh, so the question is, okay, well, if you've got three systems, two are hacked in there. Well, all of blockchain is that 49%, the 51% rule where, where if, uh, if you have more than half of the people in there, that you do, then, uh, then you can compromise the system. We have checks in there um, for that. So what we are doing is, one, we're securing it, we're doing multi-layered approach on that thing, right? If, if it's compromised, we have to have other layers of security on this thing. This cannot exist without other layers of security that, that we have on there, right? So if people come in and they say, okay, you, you're, you all of a sudden, you're compromised and you're lying and then you're compromised by the same actor and then you're lying. Well, we've got some serious problems. Well, how did you get in and how did you, you should have gotten in through a 
all of the best practices and security that we've got all the way in there. So we're going to have things like Umbrella. Um, we also have been working on, um, and I'll talk to you about um, the manufacturer usage description um, as well for the device. So there's layered approaches to that. There's things we're doing with container technology too, where we're mapping all of the different types of communication that's going in and out, and we're saying this is the only thing you're allowed to talk about. I'll get into that in a, in a little bit when we talk about MUD, but thank you. It's a, it's a good question on, the, on, on that. Okay, so you can see what happens. Um, Typically what happens is that people maintain, especially in track and trace, which is one of the things, first ones that we had done, um, people maintain their own separate ledgers to keep a record of transactions. Now this can happen especially in supply chain. If you think about somebody creating a product, shipping the product and getting it out to you, uh, to the end customer, there's a lot of different people along the way. It, I, I'm saying I'm gonna ship to you some raw material, and then that, that money has to be exchanged when something, when something gets delivered. Everybody's keeping different tracks of their own ledgers, their own accounting ledgers on that, right? Um, and then you have to maintain and say, okay, was it correct or something like that? So what happens here is everybody's, if everybody's participating in the blockchain, right, and every time something changes hands, we say, okay, money was, something was, uh, goods were received, money was transferred, it was all put in the blockchain, and everybody agrees. So even if you're further down the supply chain, you're still seeing that and agreeing on that, that, that information before you're getting your supply. One of the things that we had done, yes, question there. <laughs> Sorry for the toss. So the question is, is there a standard ledger or something like that, like an accounting or some, something? What we did is it's a key value pair, right, on this stuff. So it's going to start to look a lot like a MapReduce or something like that where it's just key values. So we just, we, it, the most general form of data that you could put in there in a database is just key value pairs and you could tag it with what you want. All of the other kinds of database technology that you do if you want to do relational technology or queries or no SQL can be built on top of that. Right? So if somebody wants to view that in a way as like an accounting information or something like that, we, you can do that on top of a key value pair, and that's what we did. Yeah. Yes? So the question is, do we use, write our own protocol, do we use Hyperledger or Ethereum? Um, the distinguished engineer, Ram, who, is, uh, who started working on this, is part of the Ethereum group. He sits on the board on that. We wrote our own protocol on top of this stuff, very similar and based on Ethereum, but it is our own. Okay. So the question is, was, are we using open source or anything like that? But it's our. No, we're not open sourcing it. There will be open source portions of this uh, upon that stuff, but it was there. So, I'm sorry? All right, so the question is. Yeah. Okay, so that's a good question. There you go. Okay, so the question is are you being creepy? Are you going to make sure that you're going to hold back the stuff that you want and you're still going to make money? You're going to charge us an arm and a leg for it. That's what it is. Now, um, yeah, what's behind the green curtain? Take a look, at, that's why I talk about the, um, uh, about the alliance. We're going in this with an alliance approach. Everybody in, the, in, the, in that alliance knows what we're doing and we're talking about that and we know the underlying prospects of it. Would we open source it? Yeah, maybe eventually when we get down to it, but right now you can't because we're st it's still in flux in there and if we open source it and stuff, we're, it's, it's a management of, of, of different means of what we're trying to do. We have very specific goals of what we're trying to do with the blockchain. It's a world-class, planet-wide, I'll get into it. A world-class, planet-wide blockchain. I mean, the, the fact that we are running this across the planet, we literally are running this across the planet on, on this. Our own supply chain is being run on this thing. Uh, um, so I'll, I'll, start to, I'll start to go into the examples. We, it's too early to open source that. We, we have to keep it close in order to get the development on that, right, is, is really what it is. It's not like we're holding it back, like, oh my God, we've got something and we really want to make you guys pay for it. No, it, it, we have to hold it close because we're developing it and we need to know. We, we literally have all the developers in one room doing this. This, okay. Let's get to the. Oh, that was wrong. One. Okay. So how does blockchain work? I talked about that. Uh, the updates to the distributed ledger are time stamped. All the updates to the data, the key value pair, are time stamped. They're grouped into a block. Multiple parties verify the validity before it's put on the on the, on the ledger. 
we are, we are just basically running a consensus protocol. Everybody agrees that it's going to go on there. Everybody stamps it and puts it in there. We're not doing the proof of work on that. That's the biggest portion that you have to keep in mind on this. Okay. Um, the thing that happens is the transactions can go across multiple parties, right? So it's a distributed ledger. There's trust amongst the, amongst the people in the group. It's decentralized. And it allows this secure exchange of information. That's what we've been talking about all this time. Okay, so I hope that's obvious. Okay, it's fundamentally different from the client server solutions. If you think about what happens is everybody has to update a certain database. If you're talking about like uh, Swift transactions that are, that are going on, I mean, I'm not saying that the whole, the whole, uh, the whole economy or, or, um, or, or cash transfer system that the, that the world runs on, like on, which is basically Swift, is going to change. The reason Swift works, if anybody doesn't know what Swift is, the, uh, is, the, um, is the company that allows for the exchange of cash across, across around the world, basically. So everybody subscribes to it. It's like in the old days, you're just sending a telegram. There's one telegraph service in there, right? You go to Swift. You post in your transactions. Everybody's working on sending the money in there. What, what happens in here is everybody's logging into the one system, checking that your money was, was transferred. Yes, it is. You've got one centralized server in there that you're doing it. You could decentralize that whole system and say, look, I don't need anybody in order to transfer money, right? We can keep this completely open and we can transfer money across there. That's what the blockchain people are doing. If you wanted to do it privately, if just say Cisco, our supplier, our banks, and the people who are manufacturing our gear, we decided we don't want to use Swift transfer for cash. We could have come up with our own, our own system for, for keeping our, our, um, our accounts in balance. I transfer the money to you, you, you transfer the money to me. We, we agreed that the money was transferred, right? Um, this distributed architecture lends itself immediately to one application that we were, we were drawn to in the beginning, which is track and trace. So one of the things that we did is we took our optical modules, all right? So everybody knows our optical modules are used to, to add more, or more memory onto, um, onto our switchings. If we put an optical module in a switch and it fails, or it's a counterfeit part, okay, you can have all kinds of problems that are going on with the product, and then if one switch is not working correctly, then it, it, it the effect is it goes across the network. We wind up getting a lot of customer service Cisco TAC calls, um, and then we trace it down, and it winds up being a faulty, or more, more often than faulty, counterfeit part, which is, the, which is the optical module. So we wanted to find something that gives us the prominence of that, of that part. So what we did is we, took a track, we, we built a track and trace application on top of the blockchain as the first one that we did. So Cisco's supply chain is very deep. There are five or six levels of of people that manufacture the parts and then ship it and then put it out by the time it gets to you. So what you can do now um, is you can look at a, uh, we can look at an optical module, take a look at the, at the ID on it and say, where is this supposed to be? Because as the optical module moves from the assembly line parts to, to shipping, to ship to a different part, to the supplier, to the partner, all the way out to you, it's being logged in the blockchain all along the way. All those participants in our supply chain are participating in the blockchain and, and then saying, Part was moved, part was moved, part was moved, part was moved. By the time it gets to you, you can look at it and say, oh, okay, this one's supposed to be in Kuala Lumpur, and I'm in Patterson, New Jersey. It's not, okay, it is, it is a counterfeit part, all right? Because people are faking those labels in order to put that on there. And we have found a lot of counterfeit gear that way. Um, and it was the first way that we were gonna try this out. We were dog-fooding it inside Cisco or drink your own champagne is a more, more polite way of doing that, yeah. Um, okay, so the, the question is, well, I, I might be in a, and that's a, that's a really good one, I didn't really get into that one. Oh, sorry, that was a good bounce. Okay, so the question is, all right, we're all going to be in this, shared, in this shared system, but I put some stuff on that ledger, I need it on the ledger, I don't want everybody seeing that. Okay, so one of the things that we did in our blockchain mechanism is we put role-based access. The same thing that you do in databases, we put role-based access for the fields. Right. So 
we were the first blockchain, we are the only blockchain I think that I know of that does that, that has role-based access across the different things so that you get to see, see it. One of, the, one of the systems that we built downstairs, if you take a look at it, is every single one of, um, in the system that we built, uh, that we're still developing it, um, every time you commit a configuration change to the network, it is stored in a blockchain. So what that means is all your configs are being put on, onto, the, onto the blockchain. I could see the record of all the changes every time, the, every time the switch is changed. Now, one of the things that happens in blockchain as well is that there is a notion of a smart contract. A smart contract, for those of you who are database, no database, it's like a stored procedure. It's code that you can run when something is committed, when something is exited, or, or same thing with databases, right? When something is, uh, you can do it when there's an update, when there's a delete, or when there's a change. You can run some code. Well, we put in a smart contract on the config changes for the, for the network that check against HIPAA compliance, GDPR compliance, and things like that, so that you can see that if your network stays in compliance in real time, up to date, okay? Now, the question you had before was, okay, what about role-based access? Well, not everybody should be able to see all that, right? So maybe my auditor can see slices of that, my network admin can see slices of that, so we use role-based accesses for that, yeah. Yes, absolutely. All of it is encrypted. Yeah, all of it is encrypted and role-based access. Yes. Everything we do, we put in there is encrypted, and then there's role-based access on top of that. Yes. Um, and as well, one of the things that we, now that I brought up GDPR, one of the things that we put into our blockchain system as well is uh, GDPR compliance is, uh, says that you have the right to be forgotten. But wait, I put you in the blockchain. I have the history of everything that ever went in there. So now I say forget Bob. Well, I still see Bob. So we built in those mechanisms, too, to go back and, and, um, and, and uh, delete the information. It's not deleted. We just get rid of the keys so now no one can see it anymore. So the question was, are we encrypting the data that goes in there? Yes, we are encrypting the data in there and doing role-based access on top of that. Yes? That's a really good question, yeah. <laughs> um, the majority of the stuff that we're doing, it, it's, it's growing and, and we're looking at it to offload it. So that question, I don't know on that one. Um, I'm, I'm 80, I wanna say I'm 80% sure on that thing that we can do that because with the role-based access, we could say, okay, get rid of part of it and then move it out, but I'm not sure about that, so let's follow up in the room. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, what, what we did is, yeah, so that's a really good question. I don't know about the trimming of the data on that one, but I'll put that one in the room when we're done. Um, I, I can tell you what we did for ourselves in, in the track and trace. We went back with over 10 years of, of um, inventory information and pumped it back into, the, into it, right? Because we had all the information, we pumped it in. Yeah, question. Yeah, I don't want to say on either one, so I don't want to mislead it, but we do, we do things like that with the link, but I don't want to get into that one. I'll, 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 I'll respond back on the list to make sure. So the, the specific question that we'll take a look at and I'll post in there is uh, what we do for the truncation of, um, for truncation of data. Yeah, that's why we don't do that, yeah. Question of it. Yeah, uh, there are different schemes in there, so I don't want to say so. Now, and, and it's a really good one, but I don't want to. I don't want to say which one it is. These are all schemes that I know we've. I've, I, re I remember us talking about all these. I don't. I don't recall which one we're doing on that. On, on that one, so I'll. I'll put the definitive answer on the um, back on the team. So check the team space on that one. Oh, I'm so, I'm sorry. The uh, global data. Um, uh, uh, was it the? Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, the <laughs> Yeah, early in the morning. Yeah, go with the. Yeah, it's European. The GDPR is a uh, is a, a standard for the uh, European Union on the uh, retention and distribution of, of information, of personal information on that front. So you have to stay compliant in there, and the fines with that are very high. You can lose up to three percent of your uh, gross. Um, 
your gross revenue uh, is the fine on that if you do not retain people's, uh, if you retain people's data against their permission. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a, high, there's a mark on that one. Okay, so let's get into the next one. Thank you for those questions, but I'll, I'll get that one on the, on the other one. Okay, so when to use a blockchain, when not to use a blockchain. There are times, the question was there, yeah. So is there a, the question is, is there a max data or anything like that? No, we use your own offline storage on that, yeah. So one of the things in the architecture that we do is that, is that our blockchain node also has a notion of a client, a blockchain client, which can, have, can be pointing to a node. That's how we do it on our switches. Our switches are not storing the blockchain information, right? You've got more important things to do on your, on your, on your 9K than store the blockchain information on that. So the client then is working against the blockchain node that might be doing that, might be running on DNA or something like that or somewhere in the, in the fabric. In the switching fabric. So when to use a blockchain? Um, th this, we, I put this one out there so you could see when it is. That the questions are sometimes when do you use when do you use a database? When can I? And the question the gentleman asked over there was, do I use it just just use a database or should I use a blockchain? And this kind of walks you through it. Um, you know, if there's multiple entities, if it's just you and you're not going to be doing like you're storing your configurations of your switches is a good one, right? If you're going to store the configuration of your switch and it's just for your own company, you don't you don't need it. The second you need an outside authority to take a look at it, and somebody takes a look at it, and you have to go for the veracity of the information, then you're going to say, okay, I might want to use it on blockchain. So for your, conf your switch configure inf information, if I store the configuration history of all of the configs and it's stored in a blockchain, I could literally take that blockchain information, drop it on the floor, and I don't have to worry about anybody tampering with it. I could pick it up and give it to the auditor. I don't have to worry about the chain of custody of that information, of those records. If I emailed it to you, and then you emailed it to the accountant, the accountant emailed it to another auditor, we can pass that around freely all right, without having to worry about it or physically signing a paper and saying the log is, I, I swear I have not changed the logs uh, of what happened, which is what a lot of people do with that. That's the state of the art of where we're at on some of these things. So, so this is just to tell you um, uh, um, the, different, um, the different algorithms that you can go through of when, it's, when, it's, uh, when, when you should be using blockchain and when you should be using just a database or a cloud storage on that. Okay. Now the industries, and we had the question about some of the use cases, the industries where blockchains are, are, are putting le legitimate value, where we see things on there, is supply chain. That was the number one use case that we did when we were developing the platform. So track and trace across a supply chain. Our supply chain, as I said, is very deep. It goes about five vendors deep at some times. Uh, when we make something, uh, it's a definition of what we're doing in there. And you have to trust the provenance of that. The logistics is, as well, um, when it comes to somebody signed off on payment and, and I've received something uh, in construction, the job was finished, the goods were done, we signed off on it, and then I want to issue the payment for it immediately. Um, especially sometimes on goods that are shipped, when um, they have to maintain temperature, uh, that's one where it's, you have to say, look, I'm gonna take, a, I have to know that something was shipped all along the way and at the entire time, all the way along, it kept the same temperature, it wasn't changed. For things like blood, milk, things like that. Uh, trade and finance uh, is, is pretty obvious on that one. Um, that's the whole Bitcoin area that we're doing. Payments, the cash payments when you're trying to do that. Um, asset trading is one that I'm going to talk about, and you can take a look at that one down there when we're looking at energy um, generation. So if you have a, the example that we're doing down there is, is we have energy that's generated on a wind farm, and if the energy, the energy that was generated can then be tagged and logged in the blockchain, and then once it's put in the blockchain, I can buy and sell those green, that green energy credits. So if you're required to keep your data center or your your operation at a certain level of, um, of energy consumption, and you need the provenance of that energy, right? If you're, if you're running your data center, you don't know if it was running on coal or diesel <laughs> or solar because it just depends on when the, when that, uh, what, what the uh, power company was, was supplying you. If you're required to stay on green energy at that time, you might have to buy credits from someone else, so there's a trading system that can come in on that one. Um, so that's the other one. Um, the asset trading, again, tamper-proof auditable records when you're trying to look on that. Um, we use it, yeah, question. Uh, for yes, ah, bad shot. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so the question was, are we looking on that for uh, medical records as well? Uh, for HIPAA compliance, definitely we've done that. For medical records and tracking, yes, we are doing that. To say that you have multiple parties, the X-ray came from here, the person went there. So healthcare is is a classic example when there's uh, when there's different parties in there. Yes. 
I'm sorry. Oh, uh, we're we working on any blockchain for the legal side. We're not currently doing that. I don't know of any one of the, uh, Sergey, who's, um, um, who's, he's in the room, um, in, the, in the WebEx team's room. He is um, working on that. He's our business development manager, and we've got some things in the legal areas. I don't know if it's one of the ones that we're working on right away on that, but it is in there. We are doing something for corporate social responsibility with blockchain uh, when it comes to legal records, when it comes to tracking, um, tracking refugees where people want to store their information, but it's like, I don't want to put it in a central server because if I do, then I don't want to be on a list, right? Uh, so being in a list is kind of scary for, for people who are transient. So that's one of the ones we're doing, and that's a legal issue. Also, one of the legal issues that came up with blockchain was uh, people reporting, people being a witness of a crime where they want to report something, but they want to report it anonymously, like whistleblowers or things like that. Yeah. So I know those areas are there, but I'm not sure if we're actually working on a use case. Yeah. I'm sorry. So the question is, um, what are we doing in the area of quantum computing? Because if you've got a quantum computer, you're going to crack the heck out of all of this stuff, right? And I mean, I think it was an article or something like that that just recently I saw that was like some uh, two, uh, 2048 bits was, was cracked by a quantum computer or something like that. Um, I can't confirm or deny that, we would, that Cisco would definitely be working on <laughs> something to make sure that a quantum cu computer could not crack uh, a key. But I can't confirm or deny that that would be something we would definitely be looking at. <laughs> yeah. Are we using, the question is, are we using a NoSQL database in there? It, it's a key value store of our own design, yeah. Yeah, it's a key value store of our own design. Okay, key reference models. Let's go into this, because one of the things I want to talk about is IoT. So IoT use cases for blockchain means there's tons of sensors out there. Let's see how we're on time. Um, there's a lot of sensors out there. So what happens is there's a lot of, there's a lot of this, is from, this is from architecture from the open fog, um, and this is one that we look at for all of our IoT data. There are endpoints, there are gateways, there are access those in the edge, and then you start to get up into the cloud. Um, that's what we use for Cisco Kinetic. So if you're familiar with Cisco Kinetic, that's our IoT protocol. And one of the ways uh, I, I like to talk about that is you know how we're routing packets and things. We're switching and routing packets on the data level. This is sort of switching and routing IoT information up at the, at the, at the application level. That's what we're doing with Cisco Kinetics. Um, so the different things that we can do in there with Cisco Kinetics, it goes along that exact model is the, the, the use of blockchain could be for the endpoint devices and then for the information as it starts to flow. Okay, so that's one of the ways that we're gonna use um, blockchain in the IoT area. So the gentleman over there is saying like, okay, what's gonna happen on my network? We'll get tons of sensors, building sensors, lighting, everything's coming on the network. You're gonna get a lot of flow of information from unprotected areas. What are we trying to do with blockchain in order to protect that? That's one of the things that we're doing. Um, so one of the protocols that has been coming out is manufacturer usage description, MUD. This came from another inside Cisco thing. The MUD, the MUD team uh, came out about one, uh, one of the projects that I was work, lucky enough to work on, which is uh, digital building, which is lighting, where every light bulb is going to have an address, and it's PUE powered, and we're going to put it in there. We're like, well, that's when well, I light flicker. But <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> um, that light up there is plugged into a switch, it's getting PUE, and it's a light. And it's, hi, I'm a light bulb. I'm still a light bulb. What is a light bulb supposed to do? Does it have a sensor on it? So the manufacturer uses description is a way for a device to come online and say, from the manufacturer, this is what I am, this is what I expect to send, I expect to send this type of traffic over these ports, and this, and this, so you can actually tell what that device is supposed to do. Then if it's, if it's operating outside of that, I'm a native New Yorker. If you talk to any cop in New York, they say JDLR, just don't look right. <laughs> That's what you're trying to look at. You're saying, this is the description. This is what it's supposed to do. It doesn't look right. I can kind of shape that. And it's not supposed to move, around. And it's not supposed to move the light bulb. All of a sudden, it's a different area. So instead of one of the things that we're looking at, you, know, you can put that up on a file server. The manufacturer can say, OK, I'll put the manufacturer use of description on there. I'll go back to the URL to the, the manufacturer, and I get that information. But I got that manufacturer, that manufacturer, that manufacturer, that manufacturer. So what we're saying is we can set that up in a blockchain for the, for the IoT, for the IoT uh, devices. And then 
if there are changes to it, if somebody updates it, that you got a firmware update or something like that, you can see the complete history of it and you can check the veracity of it. That's what we're doing. That's what that architecture is, is telling about. We have now shipped MUD um, out with uh, the latest version of ICE, so that architecture is now implemented um, with ICE. Uh, you can run that now at the manufacturer uses description. What our team is starting to look at now is to move that, move that forward. So this is one of the pillars of what we're talking about. So gentleman, you asked about the security of, of the things. Uh, it's, it, there's no like, oh, hey, you know what? I'm gonna use this one crypto algorithm and it's gonna fix everything. It's never that way. It's a layered approach. Um, there's a couple of security um, um, uh, sessions that are out there um, that you could take a look at. And they always talk about, like, it, it, they do a good analogy with medieval, medieval forts, right? It, I'm gonna build a wall. No, I, this is a moat, and then it's a wall, and then it's a parapet, and then it's multi layers of defense on that stuff. And that's what you have to do for security. There is never gonna be one security. I'm just gonna build this thing and it's gonna work. Yes? Okay, so the question is, is there a long-term plan to put DevNet, uh, to put the stuff on DevNet so people can check it out? No. Wow, that's shocking. You know why? Because we already did. <laughs> you can go and work on the sandbox and already work on it. There's an API out there already, so, so sorry for the shock there, but no, there's no long-term plan, there's no short-term plan, we've already done it. Yeah, it's already out there, yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay, so customer use cases. Um, basically, what we're looking is for data provenance on that. Uh, is, is the next case. First, we want to make sure that the IoT device we, is behaving correctly. It's behaving the way you said you were. Now we have to look at the provenance of the information. Um, so one of the things that we're looking for in some of these use cases, again, the gentleman was talking about healthcare, connected healthcare, transportation, all of these different uh, ones. I don't know why that's switching in there. Um, what we did is in, in the IR, why is that moving? I have to keep going back and forth. I swear I wasn't clicking. Okay, so um, in our <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, so uh, our gateways now can run uh, a running blockchain. Why is it doing it? That's weird. Okay, anyway. Our routing, our, uh, we have an example downstairs. What, we do, what we've done is we've put blockchain in the, um, in the uh, IR800s. What we've done is we run a, mod a, a, a blockchain module on there. We're checking all of the messages that are coming through an MQTT gateway. MQTT is starting to be a gateway protocol where IoT sensors are sending, it, sending the information to a gateway and then with MQTT there's a publish and subscribe mechanism where, where applications can publish and subscribe and get the information from there. What we are doing on that is we are checking the messages, each message that's coming out through that is being logged on the blockchain and then what we do is we check the message again and say that looks like something we've never seen before and we're starting to log them in there. Okay, so we can tell the veracity of the messages being sent online when we're using blockchain in order to do that. Okay? Uh, it's not for high volume transactions. Right now, what, the way we've done is we couldn't keep up with the speed of like very, very high transactions on that. Right? We've tried it out with, uh, with, with sensors, information that's coming in, but if it goes up to a, to a certain rate, we're not gonna be able to keep up with that. So you're just checking against the mud? Uh, First mud to check the device. Then we are looking. We are we are we are taking a look at everything coming into the gateway because we own the gateway running on the switch, uh, on the router. Um, and then what we're doing is we're checking the messages as they come in and out, and we're logging those in a blockchain. And we can see the history of that. And say we've sent that before. It doesn't look right. You're starting to drift. Because one of the things that you could do to um, in order to with an IoT sensor is you're going to say I'm supposed to be sending temperature information, right? Um, all of a sudden it starts to send a crazy reading or something like that when it's hacked. That one's easy to find, right? What the, the, the more scary ones are the ones where it drifts ever so slightly, right? And now what we're doing is we're trending it and trying to track the drift as well. So the drifting is the one that is really, is the one that you're gonna have to take a look at. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is, use cases is for assured transport. Again, we're doing, a, we're doing thing with, uh, with milk, with mother's milk in, um, in Singapore was the first one that we're doing. There's a network of people who do mother's milk um, and in Singapore, it's hot, <laughs> and the milk can spoil pretty quickly. So we have to, we're checking to make sure that the temperature of that is kept all along the way. We did it with blood, and we did it with mother's milk as well. Uh, also in dairy, we're doing that in Brazil as well with dairy. Uh, the other one that we're doing is, and it's the example you can see downstairs, is we have a wind farm 
that's taking IoT sensors uh, that's, that's measuring the output in there. And uh, from the wind farm, um, we are recording the energy that is, that is done, logging that in the blockchain, then putting that into a system where we can then tra we can trade that. And all of the trades of that energy is being done on the blockchain. So it's, it's using all of the different th use cases that we talked about. The sensor tracking, right, to, to show that the, the information was put in there. We're also doing the monetary trading, which is trading in kind for that. So we went up the layer on that. Um, the thing that I want you to come away with on that is that we are trying those things out ourselves and doing it ourselves and getting ready to release that out. We are doing our own track and trace on that. We're trying the renewable ones to put a market on that so, we can so that we can trade um, energy on that, which gives us experience in the IoT area. And we're also doing blockchain for our own configuration and our own configuration and audit. So we're trying to find the use cases on there and go through that. If you look at the Cisco model for doing things, it's exactly the playbook we did when we did PoE and we did telephony, right? We just did our offices first, and then we started doing our, our, our call centers, and we could do our call centers, and we, were, we knew we could do 911 call centers, and we, we were way up to stack, so that's what we were doing on that. Um, the Trusted IoT Alliance is a group that we have helped found uh, these are the initial members that, uh, there's about 40 members now since 2017, so it's quite a large group now of people, um, and in the Trusted IoT Alliance, they get to get, we get together and talk about the architecture, and one of the things that the Trusted IoT Alliance does is, I'm lucky enough to run the innovation centers for Cisco, and I have 14 of them in 14 different cities, so I actually run a small, <laughs> not small, but uh, for, small for Cisco. Uh, a medium-sized global company of 14 different locations for just innovation work for things that we're doing. The Trusted IoT Alliance runs on that, on that. So we've deployed our blockchain across those. So we have blockchain nodes running on the different 14 innovation centers across the planet, coming to convergence on that for two reasons. One, we wanted to test it out, and we wanted to see how it works on the scale. And the other one, just the pure fun of it, the fact that we're running blockchain and we're like, hey, we're running across the planet, and we're coming to convergence, we wanted to do that. So we wanted to make sure we could do it at scale. It's not like there's a lot of blockchain implementations out there that are pointing to the cloud and saying, OK, you're run we're running blockchain on AWS, and you're all converging. And so what's the difference? If you're all running and pointing to the blockchain node on AWS, you've got a centralized server, and you've got one pipe. What's it really going to be when it's fully distributed and you've got it? So we tried it out fully distributed first, and then we did it on our own, our own supply chain. And our own supply chain is running some 16 different nodes uh, across our own supply chain. Yeah? The question is, will Cisco be running that? Let me put it in there. It seems natural that we do that. But the question of whether or not we would do something like that goes away from my thing, which would be the engineering of this thing and the architecture of that, and more into the monetary thing. So the, the, that question would be, could we set up a licensing model? Would we set up a service on that? Is a whole other area of expertise that, uh, that I can get into. It, it seems natural that you would want to do something like that. Whether or not we did that for a business opportunity, I'm not sure. W would we partner with somebody who did, who did that? Po definitely, right? Would we do it ourselves? I'm not sure. It's a business question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we, we tend to go with the partner model on that. So so it's I don't know is the, is the other one, and not that I don't know because I, I'm not I, I can't tell what what we're going to do for the business under that. Yep. Okay. So what industries can benefit from, from this consortium? I mean. Well, gee, I just put up every single one, right? <laughs> but I mean, um, you know, that's really what it comes down to. There's, there's a lot of different things that you can do, and I hope you get them away with that. There's IT. There's a lot of different areas on there. The automotive area is, is doing that. The automotive, especially for supply chain. I mean, I, we found out also when working with blockchain with automotive companies that the number one reason for companies to put driverless cars is for some of the automakers is not to give it to you and <laughs> to give it to the customer, to us. It's, to, it's, to, it's so that the cars can drive themselves off the assembly line to the, <laughs> to the holding areas, because that's the number one place that cars go missing. Right? And they want, they want no humans involved in that. So you can could, you could imagine it being logged, put in here, logged into the parking lot, and then moved along the way like that. Is, is 
I mean, healthcare, no, no, it's not limited to these. I mean, healthcare we talked about, and education, it's, yeah, there's some, but it's not an area of aggressive, aggressive area there. Yeah, I mean, it's a very simple one for blockchain where you could say, oh, maybe we could put everybody's grades in there and we could do distribute, but then you're getting into the database area, right? Like, is it a database or is it a blockchain? So it's a really good point that you bring up, going back to that slide that I had, which was the thought process. Should you be using it? Should I put the grades of the students in there? Oh, I could store the grades on a blockchain. Well, no, I could just go to the school and ask them on that, right? And they could sign it. So it, it gets to be in some of that overkill, right? And that's where the hype comes in and block, oh, blockchain for everything. Well, no, sometimes it's a database. Sometimes it's just a file, right? Like you have to go through, the, you have to go through that, right? Um, these these um, architecture, um, this, I'll go over this, uh, this one. The, the, it looks very similar to what we do in, 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 um, in every standards organization. We're coming up with a reference architecture for uh, the blockchain and IoT. How do we do that for protocols, um, patterns for integration at the top? So what we're trying to do is we're going to come up with the patterns of deployment. So to your point about like what's going to be coming on my network, the Trusted IoT Alliance is going to come out and say, look, when you see a system of that, it's going to be going across these lines, and we're going to put out that, that, that architecture. That's what the, the Trusted IoT Alliance is doing. For your reference, I put a lot of um, information in there, and you'll see them marked for your reference on the different types of ways that they're looking at deploying these. The point you should get across is that there are different, there are different examples of what they're doing. Like with MQTT is the one, this is the example that we did downstairs, right? Which you're going to see the blockchain protocols coming in there, and then you're going to be using IoT devices um, with uh, gateway devices coming in there. And that'll map very closely to our kinetic architecture. Right? So you'll see the, the, the validated designs and things like that uh, across the uh, kinetics platform. It'll be very similar to this. There are other areas that are coming in there in integration patterns. And I'll leave these here for your reference so you can take a look at these. Exactly, like the OSI. Yeah, and that's exactly what we, we're very much, like when you go to the standards bodies, every, that's like the, the thing that everybody does is, is like, here's the stack. And that was the one that I showed you in the fog. You can see it looks very much like the OSI layer. It's, layer one is the, is the IoT devices stuff going on there. We're, we're very much in that mindset, right, for with networking people. So you, but it helps you know so that exactly what's coming on. So uh, that's not to diss it. It's actually a really good point on that. So the, the idea is that we're working on a planet scale trust network um, at Cisco, and, and we're, we're deploying this out there so that we can either, we're either going to be releasing this out as something that you could be using, or we'll be releasing it as features that you can use. There'll be a track and trace for, for, for something that you could use. The, the compliance and audit one that we have downstairs, it's, you, you wouldn't know, if you thought about it, you wouldn't even know you were using blockchain at that point. Right? You would say, oh, I'm going to be using Cisco's uh, continual, continual assurance and saying, oh, OK, how are we doing? Well, we happen to be doing blockchain underneath in order to do that. But from your point of view, you're like, I just want to make sure that my configs are HIPAA compliant or GDPR compliant. That's what you're doing on that. So there's different ways of doing it. We're trying to use the, we're, we are not trying, we are using it um, internally as well. And then, as the gentleman said, we'll put it out on DevNet and see, see what else we can get from the developers as well. OK? So. Um, in summary, uh, hopefully that was a good introduction to blockchain and how we're using it. Um, there, there are other courses um, that happen during the week that go into a deeper dive into the blockchain, um, into blockchain and how we were doing it, especially about the certificate uh, distributions and things like that. So I'm trying to give you an overview of what we're doing with, the, with it, how it compares to databases, things like that, and then how it's going to come onto your network. Uh, the reference models and architectures are there, MUD and IoT transport. So when you start to think about that, MUD for the, for the, um, for the manufacturer uses description, and then MQTT starts to seem to be the one that's going out the most for, uh, for IoT, and then we're trying to secure that as well. Okay? So um, I will post the uh, answer to the question uh, in the WebEx Teams room. And since that gentleman did get the question over there, I'm going to pass the bottle over to him on the end. Can you pass that over there? So thank you very much. Um, it, it's a pleasure to speak with you all. Um, please do fill out the surveys. It's, a, it's, it's you know, my great pleasure to be able to present to you all, and the scores really matter to us, and I, hopefully you've got the, the information that you wanted out of this session. So thank you very much.